Welcome to our panel discussion, The Public Face of PI. I'm Harper Spiro, and I'll be moderating our panel today. A little bit about me. Uh, from birth, I had recurring skin infections, and it wasn't until I was 10 years old when I was diagnosed with an extremely rare immune deficiency called hyper IgE or Job syndrome. I spent the first 27 years of my life hiding my illness, and it wasn't until a major surgery to remove a quarter of my right lung in 2012 that I started speaking about it with my friends and family. And then in 2018, I launched the podcast Made Visible, sharing stories of people living with invisible illnesses, and I now facilitate writing classes for people with invisible illnesses and their loved ones. I was also the co-chair of the first two IDF walks in New York City. With me today are Carol Ann Demerit, Autry Beeman, and John Robison. Carol Ann has been involved in advocacy to raise awareness for primary immune deficiencies since her son, David Vetter, affectionately known as the boy in the bubble, was born with severe combined immune deficiency, SCID. At the time of his birth in 1971, a bone marrow transplant from an exact match donor was the only cure, but there was no match available in David's family. David lived in protected environments at home and in the hospital to maintain a relatively germ-free surrounding for 12 years. In 1984, just four months after receiving a bone marrow transfusion, David died from lymphoma, a cancer later determined to have been introduced into his system by the Epstein-Barr virus. <laughs> Carol Ann carries on David's legacy today through her work with IDF. She serves on the board of trustees for many years and still advocates passionately for awareness for PI. Autry was a standout NFL defensive back in the mid 1970s and early 1980s with the Minnesota Vikings, Seattle Seahawks and Cleveland Browns. At the age of 54, his life was turned upside down when he was diagnosed with a common variable immune deficiency, CVID. The diagnosis turned out to be the missing piece of the puzzle that solved his lifelong medical mystery. He'd had frequent illnesses and nagging health problems throughout his life and knew something was wrong, but never knew exactly what it was. He was diagnosed in 2007 and has been managing well in IG infusion since. He's an advocate for plasma donation and was recently featured as part of IDF's Plasma Hero campaign. And last but not least, John is a well-known weatherman at KCBD in Lubbock, Texas. He's been working at New Channel 11 since 1983. He guides viewers through the severe weather in the heart of Tornado Alley and has been selected many times as Best Weathercaster District 3 in Texas by the Associated Press. Frequently ill with sinusitis, ear infections, and bronchitis in his late 20s, he visited several allergists. He was diagnosed with CVID and began monthly IVIG in 1992. He has been washing his hands, using hand wipes, and taking care around others who are sick since the 1990s, something everyone is doing in the age of COVID. John is a passionate advocate for access to appropriate diagnosis and treatment as an active member of IDF's Get Connected group programs. I'm so thrilled to have you all here today. So let's get started. Primary immune deficiencies are not just rare, they're also often invisible. Do you find that it's difficult for people around you to understand that you have a serious condition even while you may look perfectly healthy? John, do you wanna start? I'd be glad to there. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I think like most people, I was, you know, kind of fearful and stuff. And at the time I was diagnosed, I didn't really want to make it very public. It was more of a private thing. And part of the reason for that was because AIDS had been re recently discovered and was very rampant. And I'm a tall, slim guy. Being in the media, I decided in my doctor and even my coworkers, you know, to kind of keep it low key. But what I did is try to get out and about, obviously, with friends and family and even then, it was hard for them. And even now, during COVID, it's been hard for them to realize how dangerous it is for them to come up without a mask on, you know, and respond to that. So it's been 
an interesting deal. Uh, been much more open about it since COVID, COVID came along and letting people, you know, know what is going on. People email me or text me or wonder why I'm working at home. But in general, I think it's still where people don't really understand how sick we can get just from a cough, just from a cold, you know, uh, just from, you know, a hug or something like that. So from that standpoint, you know, education has been good. It used to be um, back in the 90s and in the early 2000s, we met monthly as a group here in the Lubbock area and we'd have surrounding communities and stuff. Of course, we didn't realize getting together, all of us, was a good way to spread the germ between each other, but we were cautious. Uh, and uh, even then, they it was in the workplace and stuff, people really didn't talk very much about it. It's only been more open and, I guess, understood in recent years. So. I remember when I met the first person with my condition <laughs> here in New York City, and we sent a photo to our mutual doctor, and she said, why are you guys so close? You're too close. And it really plays to that point of, you know, making sure that you stay protected and other people protect you as well. And I think that COVID has definitely helped raise that awareness these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's helped people realize what's important and, and how to prevent illness in certain situations. I recorded an episode of my podcast back in April, 2020, with previous guests of my show, who many of which acknowledge, wow, everyone's now understanding what it's like to be a sick person or have to fear being sick um, because of COVID. And that while we hate everyone having to experience this, it is certainly valuable for those of us who are immunocompromised for everyone else to get a little piece of it. Um, what are some of the misperceptions and misconceptions you have seen in the media regarding primary immune deficiencies? Carol Ann, you wanna start us off? Yes, thank you. Given the opportunity, it is good to share your story with the media and mostly they post correctly. And each story is unique and has something very special to offer. A story in print or on television can bring attention to primary immunodeficiency and encourage conversations can help to educate other families who are struggling for answers and remind science there is still much more to do. There was a time when science struggled to solve the riddles of the immune system, but now there is so much hope. I believe our patients and our families have helped to educate physicians and put them on the right track as they continue their research. I have met many families since I joined the Immune Deficiency Foundation in 1992 and proud to know them. At our national conferences, I witness as they are so happy to meet other families just like them and realize they are not alone, particularly the children. For two or three days every other year, there is knowledge shared, coping skills exchanged, as well as phone numbers and email addresses and friends forever, and optimism and laughter everywhere. I listen as they share with me the years of living with chronic illness, fears of the unknown, hospitalizations, missed days of school or work, and sometimes lost relationships. Some are saying, oh, you will probably outgrow it. And doctor after doctor visit, and finally a diagnosis and a name primary immune deficiency and the relief, and then what follows, the diagnosis means to each patient and then to explain it to others. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yeah, I don't know in this area and for the Lubbock area, you know, uh, when I speak of it, people, you know, just have a blank stare. And even when I explain what can happen to stuff, they go, oh, yeah, but then it's like it doesn't really sink into them that it's so dangerous to us. It's, COVID is really, as you mentioned, opened the door and made that a little bit easier as far as what primary can, you know, immune problems are. But generally, I think people just think, oh, yeah, well, that's too bad. You'll get, you'll get better. At least 
that's kind of the feeling that I've gotten early on. Now, my coworkers, when I explained to them years ago uh, what I had, uh, they immediately were more cautious and, and took precautions and stuff. But overall, I don't see a lot in this area of people other than those that are affected like me and going to the immunologists and, and stuff that react a lot to it. It's like, oh, okay, that's is that like cancer or they're not exactly sure what it is. If you tell somebody, oh, I'm being treated for cancer, boom, they know, they understand. When I say, you know, I'm a primary immune patient or I've got, you know, CVID, they're looking at me like, oh, okay. So it's interesting. I think there needs to be a lot more information basically uh, on what is going on and more publicity on it, which is difficult to do with COVID already, you know, overriding everything. But uh there's still a lot of people that, uh, at least from ones I've interacted with, that just really aren't aware of it that much. Yeah, I think there's certainly a lack of knowledge in your everyday person who is not affected by it. And I think that's where the IDF does such a great job at trying to raise awareness, not just for patients and caregivers and families, mm -hmm. but also for people outside of the community. Because I just saw a post yesterday on social media saying, the first thing you can do to learn about someone's condition is to do your own research. And the importance of having friends and families do that work for themselves, not just expect that the patient is going to educate you as the loved one. And I think it's an interesting approach because there's so much that we have to manage on our own as people yeah. living with these conditions. The having to tell and educate everyone else is a job in itself. So I appreciate you acknowledging that. As you said, John, in the past 18 months, there have been increasing conversations about what it means to be immunocompromised and more awareness for the need for protection. In what ways have you seen that benefit the community and are there any downsides to that? Uh, I think it's going to be a benefit for the fact that more people, you know, when we say we have this issue, they will understand and maybe respond a little better. I know that, uh, and again, I've made some several references to family and friends. Uh, some that have seen me do treatments come over and we'd have events and I'd be in, doing a treatment and stuff over the years. Even with all that knowledge, when they were coming over initially with COVID, they were hesitant about wearing masks and they wanted to walk right up, shake hands and stuff. And so uh, I think the public still doesn't have a good grasp because we've been such a, you know, a smaller group overall and just not as much publicity or knowledge about it. So people, many of them don't really know how to react. You know, you have to kind of guide them through, hey, it's OK. You know, if you got a mask, if you got a vaccine, uh, that'll work. Now, how you reach out has uh, been an interesting um, issue there. You know, we tried locally, and I know IDF does a great job of getting the information out, but it's such a narrow group of people that are affected by it. I mean, it's a large group, but it's just not as well known as cancer and, and other uh, issues that people deal with. So I think things like this forum and, uh, you know, People like us that suffer and deal with it, if we were on web more explaining what's going on, uh, you know, being in the media, my group uh, for this during the COVID period didn't really, they wanted to respect my privacy, but I said, well, I'd like people to understand what's going on. They didn't really want me to indicate that I was at home very much. They wanted me to act as normal as possible, work as normal as possible. And even now, uh, you know, with this event, you know, conference coming up, uh, you know, I'd like to make it more public saying, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. There's people in Lubbock dealing with this. There's people in Dallas and Houston, et cetera. And it's interesting. It's like, well, we don't know. I don't know. They think, you know, that maybe it makes me look weaker or in the public eye, the people will think I'm weaker, but I don't think that's the concept there. And that's, a, I think you'd probably find that in, in maybe several corporations where you're a spokesperson or maybe you're on air and stuff that, you're you look like oh you've got this issue you know what's going on that's yeah, just from my perspective i think that that plays into the invisible side of illness and to your mm -hmm. point in many situations i think that people 
can relate to you more frequently if you hear about stories that are more personal. You're not just a weatherman. You're actually someone that they can connect with and go, oh, he's dealt with stuff and so have I. Uh, have, you get, have you given pushback to your station? Yeah, we've talked and I'm hoping through this, you know, that I can post this on Facebook. I hope that our medical anchor, co-anchor Karen will be able to do a story on it and stuff to kind of open their eyes. And because people are aware of the fact that by now, after a year, they know this is not the regular studio set. You know, now there's still some, believe it or not, that think I'm still going in the studio and back, which is pretty good. Uh, but I'm hoping they will. But uh, I don't know whether they think it reflects negatively because we've done stories on all other things, you know, and the media does that. Like my coworker had prostate surgery, you know, another coworkers had to deal with cancer and stuff. And that's been up front and out. But mine is like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, let's, uh, they don't say don't do it, but they, they definitely would rather me just act as normal as possible. So it's interesting. Films like The Big Sick and The Sky is Pink have provided a fairly accurate portrayal of what it's like to live with a primary immune deficiency. But there are many other examples of negative portrayals of particularly of SCID. Do you see these public portrayals as opportunities for awareness or a bur or burden to overcome? Carolyn, you wanna get us started? Yes. There have been two movies that I think bring my David and Skid to mind. We did not have anything to do with either movie, but their titles were similar. And my David, as my David was affectionately known as the Bubble Boy and the word bubble inserted in both titles. The first movie aired in 1975 or 76 on network TV. After viewing, David's father and I did not consider it David's story as David was horrified at the time. But I feel something positive did happen. First, it brought status and an awareness to Skid and an awareness of the plight of the PI community. Secondly, shortly afterwards, NASA called and asked that they could design and construct a suit for David Ware to safely leave his bubble and safely return to his bubble. And he happily wore his suit five or six times before he outgrew it. The second was a Disney movie that I did not view, but I asked Marsha Boyle to check it out and she did and did not have much to say about it. And I heard it was not in the theaters for very long. The other two movies mentioned were applauded by the PI community and I am happy about that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, actually, I've never seen any of those movies. I was looking at the, the questionnaire on that, so I uh, can't say much to that end of it, as a matter of fact. But uh, I think just back to the idea, there does need to be definitely more public awareness. And it's interesting because when I meet new people and I try to explain, I use a reference to, uh, to David, Carol, uh, because once I say, do you remember the bubble boy? at least for folks that are a little older, not the sure. teenagers, they're going, what? Yeah. Uh, but even some of those, some of the younger people know of your son. And uh, when I say that, they go, oh, and it's kind of like turns on a light bulb. And then I can kind of explain, okay, I'm not fortunately as serious as that, but that's the type of deal that affects my immune system. And then they get a better idea. So if you know, it, maybe that could be used some way as a basis for more education of people, since so many people remember that, believe it or not, from back then. So um, that would just be thank one example. But. Thank you, John, for mentioning that. I wanted to somehow bring that into conversation. I have met many families who, after they are diagnosed, have a hard time explaining to their family members, you know, what it is the doctor said they had. And they then the the patient will say, well, do you remember the story of David, the boy that lives in a bubble? And if they are of a certain age, they will say yes, because um, David's story was chronicled um, all over the country. And eventually I found out all over the world. They will say to that person they're trying to explain, well, I have something like what David had, not severe, but something like what David had. And so then they will answer, 
I understand now so they can explain, they can understand it. And it makes the patient feel so much better if they, if they can, can relate that part of what it is they have. They can, the person that they're explaining it, explaining it to can understand that there is some danger to what uh, primary immune deficiency is. So I'm glad you brought that up. I've always touched and I've had many families say, I didn't want to mention it to you because I thought that might hurt you. And I would tell them, oh no, I am so proud that you can mention David and David can be used as an example of what it's like to be, have a primary immune disorder. Fortunately, you know, you can, you don't have to live in, inside a bubble, but um, David had the most severe, but CBID is, dangerous too, and you have to be protected and take care of yourself. So thank you, John. Oh, I'm glad to, but I just, it has been a good reference point, you know, so, uh, and when you say that, uh, but it's amazed me, even there's younger people that still, that I encounter and stuff, of course, I haven't encountered many, except at a distance during the last year, but once I tell them, they'll understand, they have a better idea of, of what has taken place there. So uh, hopefully that will could be used forever, you know, to expand knowledge. But I think people really have a difficult time, even my wife, you know, with COVID, I've been, we've been explaining more about uh, T cells and B cells and things like that. And with my son, and I know there's 25% chance, you know, that he may end up with this. This, with me, it didn't really, when I was young, I had ear infections, throat infections all the time. And then once I got to about junior high, that was it, I was healthy. I had certificates that I went a year in school, never missed a day, healthy all the way up till about late 20s. And then I started getting the sinus infections and bronchitis. And uh, I don't know if allergies triggered it or what, and it just kept getting worse. And so uh, that happened with my daughter. She made it to um, almost around 30, 30 or so, maybe early 30s. And then she started, and I had a difficult time. It finally took me and son-in-law to convince her to go to an immunologist. She just didn't want to realize that. So I didn't mean it on sidebar, but it's funny. People really have a difficult time of grasping it. Even I'm trying to tell my wife, well, I'm one of those with the B cell issue. And she goes, oh no. So are you protected now against COVID? And the doctor says, well, maybe, maybe not. We don't have enough knowledge to know. So. Yeah, my doctor said the same thing to me. Um, but Carol Ann, you, you brought up a point that I think is really important, which is if you can make an impact on anyone's lives by sharing your story, by sharing David's story, mm. that's so huge. And that advocacy is so important and really helps to raise the awareness. I do think there are a lot of movies and books and TV shows that include uh, more about mental illness, depression, anxiety, as well as uh, cancer and some more mainstream illnesses. But I think the PI community is not really represented in a lot of mainstream media. And I think having these conversations is really important to help change that and raise that awareness and have these people who are living with this. There's so many of us represented in film and TV, uh, and even books, not just memoirs. Um, Autry, your thoughts on the public portrayal? I have uh, seen one of the movies uh, that Carol was uh, referencing, and um, I do think that it did bring awareness to uh, the immune deficiency community. And uh, I, also have a hard time explaining to people uh, that the, the disease that I have in terms of, and people just, just don't get it. I've never used the analogy of, of, of David uh, in the bubble, living in a bubble, but uh, uh, that is a good analogy, I think, and that would, uh, I think that would open people's eyes a little bit more. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's a great portrayal um, and helpful for the community. So you're all prominent members of your various communities. In what ways do you use your voice to raise awareness? Autry? 
Well, I, uh, I communicate with, uh, of course, family and friends. I have communicated over the years. I found out that I had uh, CVID uh, later in my life. I uh, found out uh, I was probably 50 uh, when I actually found out as a result of trying to uh, see if I could be a, a blood donor uh, or a kidney donor, I should say, for my brother-in-law. And uh, I asked, I didn't know what type my blood was. And as a result, I asked my doctor to, I wanted to know what my blood type was. And it came back that they couldn't type my blood. And he referred me to an immunologist, which uh, I continue to go to uh, to this day. Uh, as a result of them not being able to type my blood, and as a result of me not being able to donate a, a kidney to my brother-in-law, uh, I was recommended to do an intravenous uh, drug, Hyzentra, which is what I take today. And uh, at that time, uh, this was after my professional football career was over. This big old tough, strong football player could not imagine himself sticking uh, three or four little small needles, tiny needles in his stomach. So I was afraid. And uh, I went on about uh, like that for about three years until I got extremely sick and uh, almost uh, left this earth uh, with a brain infection. Uh, I was both at uh, about three hospital and ending up at Mayo uh, Clinic. So, and then uh, I decided that I could, uh, I could bear uh, taking a little shot in my stomachs and I'm able to uh, give myself uh, subcutaneously at home, which is very fortunate. I'll, although I have been into the uh, clinic for infusions as well. And how do you use your voice to raise awareness about primary immune deficiencies? Well, well uh, I have, uh, have asked several friends of mine. I have a, a huge network of friends via email. I've reached out to them to become a, a plasma donor, uh, to donate the plasma. Uh, because of, uh, of my disease. I, um, and I did have some a very positive feedback from, from that, which uh, some people did. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, I haven't recently cast another uh, request for, for my friends to donate pl uh, plasma, but, but I think I will uh, here shortly. Uh, but that's how I have reached out. And I tried to explain my disease to, to people that, that listen. And of course my family know, but, but I still don't think they really get it. They really don't get how serious it is. And with this, uh, the past year, I've been extremely, extremely careful to the point that I wouldn't go anywhere. Thank you for that, Autry. Carol Ann? In Montgomery County, Texas, where we lived with my David, in his memory is the David Elementary School and the residents and businesses remember his gallant life and death. David once said to me that someday he wants to run barefoot in the grass. With that in mind and spirit, each year the school sponsors the David Dream Run. All proceeds benefit the David Center at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, where all children born with compromised or faulty immune systems, whether genetic or acquired, are diagnosed and treated, and in some cases go home without confinement. Since its inception some 27 years ago, on the day before the event, I speak to the children and guests at David and share with them how we lived with David, how education was important to him and respect of others was taught and love of God and family was high on the agenda. There is always coverage before the event and I am happy to speak to anyone who asked Last year, the event was held virtual and still a significant amount of money was raised within the community. There is also the David Clinic, which is an extension of the David Center. We feel blessed that the community still embraces David's memory and his family. Um, <clears throat> no, I share David's story and I'm very happy to do that. I wish I could have ended the story differently, but I believe God had another plan for David. And I think by David's life and death put science on a path that 
has helped so many though of those suffering from a primary immune disorder. I've had so many families, I've had many conversations with families that say, you know, they they see the look on the person's face that they're trying to explain their disease. And I'm thinking, you know, I bet if they had a cast on their arm, it would be a lot easier to explain because looking at John and Autry right now, they look like the picture of health to me. And yet there is something, you know, down deep that, that is keeping them um, in danger. So I, I don't know how else, you know, what else they can do except to have them, you know, look it up on the internet. There is a lot of information out there now. And um, I think, you know, diagnosis, I'm very proud to know that SCID has been added to the newborn screening panel. So now all children born in the United States um, can be tested for SCID, but not just SCID for uh, a lack of T cells and B cells. And from there they can go and, and be diagnosed. And as we all know, early diagnosis and treatment is the key to most diseases. But I understand that the, especially the COVID patients that struggled for years and years because a diagnosis was never um, issued to them. They never had that diagnosis. And once they do, then they can find the right treatment for them. So I take my hat off to both of you for uh, participating in this event and uh, sharing your story with us. We need more stories out there because you are a success story. And I think that's what people need to hear right now. I agree with that, Carol, and thank you. John? Well, it's interesting. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, you know, my approach has been low key due to my work and, uh, and publicity and stuff. But during COVID with being here and stuff, I've tried to be more, well, I've been always open with everybody I'd see. And uh, I even, uh, I've had, you know, friends and relatives over when I'm doing treatment, you know, they might have to be at a little distance there, but there's nothing like uh, showing someone a photo of your abdomen and Autry can relate to that because they, they didn't really understand, what do you mean you're getting shots and stuff? So I took a photo and then they kind of understood like, whoa, this looks serious, you know? And I said, well, this is my weekly routine. I'm not gonna put that on Facebook. I don't wanna make people ill, but, uh, you know, it gives them a, an idea there, but I'm hoping, and especially with this event, and if the station will allow me, you know, we will put this out on Facebook and uh, the medical reporter will do a story on me. And then maybe I can finally open up, which is what I've wanted to do for years and say, hey, if you've got these conditions and or you notice this in your kids, because all my family members know when our kids are sick frequently, my wife Jill and I say, hey, have you had them to an allergist? Have you had them to an immunologist? Unfortunately, no issues there other than my grandson, obviously watching closely and watching my son. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping that I can do much more in the future than what I've done in the past, basically. So, and, and Autry, Mike could relate to this. Uh, I didn't want to be too public when I was younger because I thought if I want to change jobs, that corporation or that company is going to go, well, man, he's going to be sick all the time. And I wasn't, fortunately. I mean, I was sick, fair share. But, uh, you know, it. Uh, I had to kind of keep that in the back of my mind up until, you know, years ago. And then as more people understood, family and stuff understood. But uh, that's something I would think a person in their 20s is probably not going to want to say, hey, I have PI, you know, and, and they're going to go, wait a minute, what is that, you know? Well, I have this or that. How much work is going to be the question? How much work are you going to miss or what's going to happen, you know, working for our company? So uh, I had that in the back of my mind, and my daughter had that in the back of her mind. She's been working at home even before COVID because she kept getting, she's had, got it a little worse than me and it was always frequently ill and stuff, so... I think the work from home and COVID has certainly shifted this conversation and has made more employers a bit more understanding and relaxed, mm -hmm. relaxed and compassionate. Not all, but I think there are more that are realizing the importance of this and that their employees are capable 
of doing work from home just as well as they would if they were in the office. They just need more accommodations. And hopefully employees are willing to do that even in a post-COVID world. Um, I'm curious if each of you have a specific message that you would like the media to present out into the world that there's something specific that you think is important to be shared, whether related to your story or general about primary immune deficiencies. Well, first, I think it would be important for the viewers um, to know that it is not contagious and it is not acquired. It is something different. And um, there is uh, hope on the horizon and early diagnosis um, can help with a, a better quality of life. And sometimes before diagnosis, um, the, the quality of life is, is not good. But with diagnosis and treatment and, and support of, of family and friends and groups, um, when you meet someone that has something like what you have, uh, so many things do not have to be said because that person you're speaking with understands and there is compassion and there's understanding and there is sharing of, of ideas. And I think also important that the patient has to be an advocate for themselves or their child. And there was a time in my generation where you just sat back and you believed um, everything your doctor told you and you did exactly what he wanted. Now, David was lucky, we were lucky that we were at Texas Children's Hospital in the vast medical center, and we had two immunologists, but um, where I came from, where David's father and I came from, um, they didn't have an immunologist. And I always, I'm heartbroken at the thought that I may have lost two sons and never know why but at least David had a chance. And um, many other families, now that we have skid newborn screening, it's very important. Um, and there are a lot of success stories out there and I think they should be um, remembered and told. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree with that. <clears throat> Do you want to add something, Autry? Well, uh, I agree. I agree with uh, with that uh, assessment. And uh, by educate, educating other people uh, to what uh, the disease that we have, and um, I guess when I was growing up. I never even heard of the word immunologist or a doctor. You know, you just went to the doctor and I went to the doctor a lot uh, when I was young with infections, different infections and stuff. And my mother was a, a school nurse. Sometimes she would just uh, give me a shot of uh, antibiotic at, at home. But uh, uh, as I've, as, as I've uh, become uh, older, I can look back and see the times that uh, that I was, of course, I was uneducated, and so was so were other people. Uh, I found a good resource in the uh, the immunology book uh, that uh, that I have written and gotten sent to people. Uh, it 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 has a lot of information in there. But I, I think it's it's a good resource that you can drill down and at least get some type of education from that. I think it's a very useful tool, and I I advocate for that as well uh, to to other people. And if uh, somebody is is in my home, I have one here. I usually have two, and I can give them one if if we read and they want to look into it a little bit further. Uh, so that's another way of, of trying to educate people. So, John, I would think uh, you know when I first was diagnosed, uh, 
I was just very fortunate. Dr. Mamlock here in Lubbock was an immunologist, but you know, with my son, my wife and I knew from Dr. Mamlock's references to find an immunologist because we knew it would run in the family. But I think, I think doctors still need just your average practitioners, nurse practitioners. They need knowledge of it. You know, if I go to a new doctor or having I have a little knee injury or something, I go in there and I'm saying, well, you know, they'll say, well, you need. We'll try this, that, and I'll say, well, wait a minute, i got to give you my medical history, and I start telling them, and they're going, I never heard of CVID, or what is CVID? You know, more of them know now, but most of them still don't know really what it is, and our, like when we tell our new relatives with their new kids, you know, my niece over here knows what it is quite frequently with her young boys and what to watch for. So I think, I still think physicians and the hospitals and such need more information out there. I know people don't really pick up brochures anymore. Uh, I work with an adult protective group here trying to protect the elderly from abuse. And we have brochures and and uh, people go, oh yeah, it's nice, you know. you got to figure out a digital way or something visual. And people need to kind of look at their ancestry because I remember when I was diagnosed with this that my mom and dad, uh, my mom had passed away, but my dad was still alive. That my mother's father had died of pneumonia and I didn't think much about it back then but then I found out that my um, father's parents did, died in the flu pandemic they had the flu but it immediately developed the pneumonia and I thought wait a minute my dad had pneumonia bouts off and on very frequently when he was young his doctors knew nothing and I didn't think we just thought okay you go to the doctor you go to the, and gets well and, stuff. and then I realized that's a connection Apparently, we think there wasn't, we didn't get DNA testing or anything done or blood or anything uh, because my parents passing away. But, you know, people would, if they'd kind of look at their background and ancestry and say, well, you know, we had a couple people we lost, you know, from pneumonia and this person was sick all the time. Uh, I've got a cousin in East Texas that she kept talking about being sick. And I said, wait a minute, uh, you know, and she's within our bloodline. She goes, oh, wait a minute. I got to tell my doctor about this. And sure enough, they began to discover more stuff. So, so that I don't know how you tell the general public that or how you get it out or if it's through family, but I think the physicians are the key. And then uh, also the fact that, uh, and it was mentioned either by Carol or Archery that when you first mention it, people think it's acquired. Even from the, that's what my fear was when I, I was first diagnosed is, and so you have to get past that to know it's not acquired and I'm, I'm not going to give it to you, but it's within your family line. So. I'm really glad you brought up the doctor component because I do think there are many, many doctors out there who are not educated on this, especially general practitioners. Mm. Uh, I've seen many a doctor, so I'm like, I know my history is weird. I know that this is not something you've seen before and it's become my routine. I'm used to acknowledging that, but if they spend more than one slide in a power pre PowerPoint presentation in med school on these different conditions, they'd be more educated and be able to serve us better. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today, Carol, Ann, Autry, and John. Thank you so much.